uh, the new book of Exodus. I remember last week as we finished up in our conclusion, we saw that the book of Genesis, a, a book of beginnings, but not of completions. Uh, it commenced with a majestic phrase, in the beginning God, but then the book ended with that sorry phrase, in a coffin in Egypt. And, and we saw that it's a book that it, it demands a way out of that coffin in Egypt. Or else the faith, the men we read about in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Joseph whose bones are in that coffin and their faith would be of no effect. So the name of this book, Exodus, is in itself the answer to the need that Genesis brings up. Exodus is the name of the book, the second book of Moses called Exodus. Exodus means the way out. Two words. Hadas means the way and X is out. And it's the way out. The book means the way out. The, the theme of this book can be found in a few verses. Uh, turn to the sixth chapter. Exodus 6 and verse 6. Wherefore, Say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. Redemption is the, is the theme of this book. Redemption. Six, six. Sixty-six books in your Bible. Talk about God redeeming man. Exodus 6.6. 6. The word redemption is found ten times in the book of Exodus. Turn to Exodus um, 15, chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. We'll make some introductory comments before we dig into the verses. But the theme of the book, it's the book of the way out. It's the book of redemption. Uh, Exodus chapter 15, uh, verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Who is like unto thee among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The, the theme throughout this book is redemption. Uh, turn to the 20th chapter. And I'll, I'll do an outline for you and show you the various chapters. Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It's the way out. Exodus is the way out. And what we're going to find out now, redemption, if you were to look in a dictionary, the word redemption means to purchase back. It means to ransom, to liberate, to rescue from captivity or bondage. Of course, the bondage of sin and its wages, which is death. That's why they're in a coffin in Egypt. It's to repurchase what has been sold. It's to free by making an atonement, to pay the penalty of, to save. That's redemption. That is the uh, theme of this book. As you go through the book, it breaks down. I found it breaking down. I looked at it into six different uh, divisions in the book. I'll put them on the board. The first three sections deal with the Redeemer. And they break down as follows. Chapters 1 through 6. Chapters 7 through 11. Chapters 12 through 14. Chapters 1 through 6 show the need for the Redeemer. And we'll see the need. Chapters 7 through 11 will show the might of the Redeemer. Chapters 12 through 14 will show the method of of the Redeemer, the method of His redemption. The next three sections after that will look at redeemed, the people who are redeemed. And what we'll have here is in chapters 15 through 18, we'll see the pilgrim journey of the redeemed. Chapters 19 
through 24 will show us the duty of the redeemed. And then chapters 25 through 40 will show us a provision Someday we'll get a PowerPoint. <laughs> provision for the failures of the redeemed. Because you're going to find that the, uh, the redeemed are flesh and blood like you and me. And they fall down a lot and they fail and God makes provision for them. Now as you go through the book, historically, remember every verse in the scripture, because it speaks to all ages, will have a historical meaning for the past, it will have a doctrinal meaning looking to the future, and it will have a spiritual present day meaning to you and I as readers. Obviously the book of Exodus is not written to us, but there's spiritual application we can learn from the book. That's important, folks. <laughs> I listened to a teacher last night on the way home in the car. He's just a rip. That guy is so funny. I, I guess it wouldn't be funny. It's not so funny. He's on the radio. People listen to him. This Harold Camping. But he takes every passage in the Bible and he spiritualizes it. And, and, and yes, there's spiritual application, but he has no concept of the doctrine of a passage that he's reading. And <laughs> so it's so funny. Somebody called him last night and asked him about 1 Thessalonians 5.23 where it says, I pray God will sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body until the coming of the Lord Jesus. And he says in that particular passage, the man asks him, it sounds like uh, there are three parts to a person. Oh, no. Oh, no. The Bible doesn't teach that people have a body, soul, and spirit. So, but, I mean, it's funny guy. He's funny. You'd have to listen. If you want a good laugh, turn him on sometimes. It's 89.9. But, but we're going to study tonight, and we're going to take a look at this book. There is historical truth. Historically, as we study this, it's going to be the Exodus, it's going to be the way out, it's going to be the redemption of the nation Israel out of Egypt. That's the historical teaching that we'll get here. The spiritual application would be a picture spiritually of the redemption of a born-again Christian out of sin. The way out of sin through the mighty Redeemer. And the, you'll see the journeys in your life. You'll see the duties that God would have you to do. And you'll even see the provision that God makes for your failures as spiritual. All the pictures will be there. The doctrinal application of this book, first and foremost, is going to be about Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. There's a dual-fold doctrinal application here. The first one will be Jesus Christ. When you get to Matthew 2, I want you to plug your finger in there and then turn back a few books in the Old Testament to Hosea chapter 11. And I'll show you a few passages. Doctrinally, this book is going to point to the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not surprised because in all things he has the preeminence. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 2, Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11. Here we go. Verse 1. We read. This is a verse written around 700 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. You see that? So now Hosea the prophet is writing to the Jewish people in 700 B.C. This is many years after the Exodus. The Exodus takes place in 1900 uh, B.C. or around then. And so this is many centuries after the Exodus. And he's saying right here in this verse, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. So you think, okay, he's, the, the prophet Hosea is talking about an historical past tense event. And yet that very verse written in the past tense is actually in the prophetic voice about Jesus. How do I know? Turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and look at uh, verse 15. Now this is when the angel tells Joseph to take the young uh, child and his mother and flee into Egypt. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 15. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. 
we'll do it someday. Oh, I, I think I've taught this once before on prophecy and the prophetic voice. Didn't we do a teaching on that once? We'll do it again sometime. We're not going to do it tonight. But I just wanted to show you. Doctrinally, the Exodus is going to be about the Lord Jesus Christ. A. Number B, the doctrinal application, B is going to be, Exodus is going to be a picture of the remnant tribulation Jews being called out of the clutches of the Antichrist. And when we studied Revelation, if you remember, the very plagues of Revelation mirror the very plagues in Exodus. The locusts, the darkness, the fire on the ground, all those things. So I just wanted to show you. Now let's go back to where we were in Exodus before we start commenting on the verses. So as we go through, I'll point things along as we're taking our journey. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm always digging around for things, and I found this interesting chart in um, Nelson's, a book by Nelson called uh, Nelson's Complete Book of Bible Maps and Charts, Old and New Testaments. And it had a nice chart in there that I wanted to share with you a little bit. And he, he, he went over the five books of Moses. And this is probably good to have in your notes. This might, this might help you. And he puts up here at the top, he's got the book, which book it is, of the five books of Moses, what the key idea is, how it relates to the nation, who the nation would be, what people, how it relates to the people, how it relates to God, his person, his character, and his command. In the book of Genesis that we just finished studying, the key idea is that of beginnings. It was a book of beginnings. We saw in the beginning God created. We saw him start a garden. We saw him create a man and a woman. We saw him uh, call out a nation and begin a nation in the man of Abraham. In the beginning here, in the book of Genesis, the nation is chosen. God chose Abraham from all the other ones. The people were being prepared as we saw the wanderings of Abraham through Canaan and Isaac and Jacob and then finally Joseph going down into Egypt and then the rest being going down. God is preparing them. The, God's character in this particular book was one of creator or his person was one of creator. His character was found, I am the almighty God. He showed his strength throughout the book of Genesis. Matter of fact, he didn't even reveal one of his names to us. The name gets revealed later on to Moses in the second book. The command that he has throughout this book is let there be. But now when we move to the book of Exodus, we see some changes in the presentation. Now that we're here, the key idea is no longer beginnings. It's what we talked about. It's redemption. And here we see not the nation chosen, but the nation delivered from bondage and from slavery. Now we see the people redeemed. They've been purchased back. Now they're God's possession. We see now God as the Redeemer. And He's the only one that can buy back us from sin. He's the only one that can pay the penalty for sins. Religion can't do it. We see God's character not as almighty, but as merciful. Although we see some of his might in the book. And the command now is let my people go. If you want to continue, I'll just show you for the rest of the books as you can have them in your notes. The next book we're going to get to after Exodus will be the book of Leviticus. When we get there, the idea is going to be worship. Because now that the tabernacle is built, God's going to speak to the tribe of Levi and tell them how to go about proper worship. You and I become saved. We become priests unto God. He'd like to teach us proper worship. The nation now, after being delivered, it's now set apart from all other nations. As the people were set apart. The people now are being taught They've been redeemed. It's time to teach them God's truths. God is now, in terms of his person, he's seen as sanctifier. 
He sanctifies us. He sets us apart. His character is seen as holy. And His command to us then is be holy. Because I am holy. So how do we do it? We get close to the one that is holy. That's the theme that we'll find in Leviticus. When we move to the next book of Numbers, which I love, one of my favorite books, the key idea you're going to see is the wanderings, the journeys. Because God's people wander and journey down here. It'd be nice if he just saved us and took us to heaven and beamed us up, beamed me up, Scotty. But he doesn't do that. He keeps us down here because he wants to work through us. So we wander down here. And so the nation, we see them being led by God as the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud leads them every single day. The people are being, now they've been taught, now it's time to be tested. After God brings us to church and teaches us, then he lets us go Monday through Friday and Saturday and he tests us on what he taught us. That's the way he does things. We see God now as the sustainer. All week long he sustains us. He keeps us going. We see his character as one of just. God is a just God. He's not a respecter of persons. And so as we walk through life, he wants us to be just in the way we deal with people. And his command to us is go in. That's the command he had in Numbers. Go in. Take the land. To you and I, it's go in to the workplace. Take it for God. Be holy there. Be just. Be led by me. Finally, the last book we'll see is the book of Deuteronomy. The last of the five books of Moses. The key idea here is the covenant... I'm not a good speller. Coven, uh, well, somebody knows how to spell it. I don't. <laughs> C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T, right? right? Okay. The covenant is renewed. The key idea is the covenant is renewed in Deuteronomy. Deutero means second. Nami is law. It's the second giving of the law to God's people. Why is that? Well, just like Jonah, sometimes we don't get it the first time. Okay, How many times has God had to teach you or me a lesson the second time? So lots of times the covenant has to be renewed with us as he's teaching us. The covenant is renewed. Now the nation is being made ready. And I hope by the second time we're really made ready to do what we'd have, God would have us to do. What's happening? We're being retaught. Verily, verily, Jesus would say. Okay? I mean, repetition is the mother of teaching. He's got to repeat and repeat and repeat to us. We see God as a reminder here, as he reminds us the things that we need to do. We see his character as loving because he, he waits until we grow in grace and knowledge. And the command he has for us is obey. If ye love me, ye will obey my commands. And so that's a good chart to have in hand when you consider the five books. Now today, we're going to start into Exodus, the book of redemption, where the Redeemer will deliver his redeemed in mercy. And he'll say to all others, let my people go. Let my people go. The book of Exodus. As we go through it, you have that chart down? Because I'm going to erase it. As we go through it, we'll see that uh, the various chapters now, we'll go through them one by one. Chapter 1 is going to outline in three divisions to it. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you have paragraph markings in your Bible, but if you do, the first verse would be a paragraph. Chapter 8 should have a paragraph marking. And then chap or, or, excuse me, uh, verse 8 should have a paragraph marking. And then verse 15. And therefore, that one chapter would break down into three sections. And the verses 1 through 7, what we're going to see is a new generation. A new generation. In verses 8 through 14, we're going to see a new king. And in verses 15 through 22, we're going to see a new strategy that this king is going to employ on God's people. This outline is from Dr. Wearsby. I like this. So we're going to work our way through this today, and uh, I think we're ready to go. I'll leave this up for a few more minutes before I erase it and put the chapter 1 outline. And so in chapter 1, pretty much the heading that we would have is the persecution of God's people. The persecution of God's people. Now we begin the second book of Moses called Exodus. Let's read the first seven verses. 
Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Chapter 1. The persecution of God's people. Verses 1 through 7, we have a new generation. We have a new generation. We start out in contrast to the way Genesis started. In the beginning, God starts out with the Almighty. Exodus, the second book, starts out with the names of men. I don't see God in the verse. I see the children of Israel and I see a man, and then I see the names of men. Now, we're going to see some differences here, because what happens is, we start out on the mountaintop, and now we're in the valley in bondage in Exodus. God's going to have to bring us out back to the mountaintop. But he starts this book, and he starts with the names of these men. Why the names? You know, names are so important to God. There are more chapters with names in them than there are chapters about the creation of the universe. Because God's more concerned with the people in the universe than with the universe itself. That's good. We're made in His image. He happens to love people. He's a people God, or people person, in, Jesus, in this case, because Jesus is a person. He's a people person. Names are important to God. Names are connected with redemption. Jesus was speaking one day to his disciples, and they were all excited. They had just come back from a trip that he had sent them on, and before he sent them on the trip, he empowered them, and he says, you'll be able to cast out demons, and you'll be able to raise the dead, and you'll be able to do miracles and wonders, and they came back, and they were so excited, like a good group of Pentecostal charismatics, we cast out this demon, and we could do all that, and Jesus says, rejoice not that you can cast out devils. Rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. And, and, and that's what we need to rejoice about. The fact that God cares so much about people, he records names. These names right here are written in heaven. This word is settled in heaven. Jesus, uh, Paul, learned a lesson from Jesus and he told it to the other disciples in Philippians chapter 3. He said, the gospel, in the gospel, names are in the book of life. I mean, people who receive the gospel have their names written into the book of life. And so here's the book of life. You have the Bible in your hands. That's the only book of life down here, folks. Any other book you read isn't going to give you eternal life. And here, right here in the book of life, here are the names written down. God loves people and their names are connected with redemption. These names are all connected with the redemption. The tribes of Israel. Another thing we learn, though, about these people. These are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Which came into Egypt. What's Egypt a type of? It's, it's taught a lot in, in, in most circles. Egypt is a type of the world. Now in my readings, I don't exactly get that. I, I get it to be a little different in my readings, but it's very similar. I find Egypt to be more a type of the flesh and of the earth than it is a type of the world. But of course, the world is made up of fleshy people on the earth. So there's a lot of similarity between the two. But let me just give you some reasons why I say it that way, and I'll show you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then after that, we'll get to Ezekiel chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 16. First Corinthians chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter. And in here he's talking about the difference between our earthly body and our heavenly body. 
And, and he, he talks about, in verse 45, that the first man, Adam, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. He, would, he had a natural body. That was the first man, Adam, that we read about in the book of Genesis. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy, dust, lifted up by God, fashioned into a body, breathed life into it. That's Adam, earth. Now, all these men recorded for us in the book that we're reading in Exodus, all those names they came down, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the fathers, the patriarchs, led all their kids down into Egypt. And we record the names of all those young children of Israel in Egypt. They're in Egypt. They're in bondage. A picture of being in their earthy condition, in their unregenerate corruptible, earthy condition. Now, the first Adam is of the earth, earthy, earthy. Now, go to Ezekiel chapter 16, and I'll show you what I get in my readings. Talk about three enemies that the Christian has, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Egypt, to me, is more a picture of the flesh than it is the world or the devil. The world is involved there, the devil's involved there, but it's more a picture of the flesh. Uh, is uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, verse, uh, get a running start, uh, let's say 23. We're going to go to 26, but I just want to show you. Uh, verse 23, and it came to pass after all thy wickedness. We're talking about wickedness here. Woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God. Thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place. Thou hast made thee a high place in every street. Thou hast built the high place at the head of every way. Thou hast made thy beauty to be abhorred, and opened thy feet to everyone that passeth by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors great of flesh. Egypt is likened right in the verse to flesh. See, you and I aren't so much saved out of the world as we're saved out of our first earthy birth. We're saved out of the first Adam and placed into the second Adam. We're placed into the second man and move on like that. So I see this picture of the fathers leading us into Egypt. What, what, what God wants to show us in the picture here in Exodus is you know where your fathers are going to end up if you follow them? In a coffin in Egypt. You're going to end up in bondage. Uh, like Paul was saying in 1 Peter chapter 1, he was saying, First uh, Peter chapter 1, I'll read it to you. Peter was saying this, excuse me. Peter was saying in First uh, Peter chapter 1, he was saying, uh, we're being born again. And he says, not of a corruptible seed. What's that corruptible seed? Verse 18, for as much as you know, you are not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, or from the vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Mm -hmm. Our fathers, with their corruptible seed of First Peter 1, 23 and 18, will lead us right into bondage in Egypt. They don't mean to do it, but that's what they do. That's the way of all that are in Adam. Earthy. Bondage. Death. It's a type. Egypt is a type of of fleshy, earthly men running things. So they do have kind of a world system of their own. There's another kind of world system that's run by the devil. And you'll see he gets into this too. But really, even if you never got involved with the devil, and even if you stayed out of the world, even if somehow you were like Lord of the Flies out on an island all by yourself, living in your own natural condition in the flesh, you would end up in a coffin in Egypt. You'd end up in bondage to your flesh, and you'd end up without God. And that's what this is a picture of. So, so I see this. Now, going back to where we were in, in Exodus. We see that the children of Egypt came into the land with 70 people. Verse 5. Joseph was in Egypt already. But what happened? Like happens to all of us, because of Genesis chapter 3, Joseph died. Because of the fall, death is certain, and Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. Well, thankfully, 
even though one generation dies, another goes on, and God in his mercy allows the children of Israel to be fruitful. And they increased abundantly, and they multiplied, and they waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. They were in the most fertile part of the land, up there in Goshen. They had plenty of goods. They worked hard, but the land brought forth plentifully for them, and they multiplied. How many? Well, they started with 70. Turn to uh, chapter 12 of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. And look at verse 37. Exodus 12. And verse... Uh, 37. When they come out after the Passover, and God delivers them, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses or Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men. Besides the children, besides the wives, I don't know how many of those men were married, but if they were married, that's 1,200,000. And if they had two kids in each family, that's 2,400,000. That's 2,400,000. They, they did just as it said right here. They were fruitful. They increased abundantly. They multiplied. They waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. The land was filled with them. So the new generation comes and the new generation grows. Of course, the new generation is uh, of the earth. And of course, that's going on today. People of the first birth are increasing and increasing and increasing. And we see the population explosion around us continuing to multiply. Now what happens? Verse, verses 8 through 14, we have a new generation. Now in verses 8 through 14, we have a new king. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. A new king comes up, a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now, now this king is mentioned a couple of times in, in the Bible beyond this passage here. I was doing some studies on Egyptian history. And, uh, <laughs> folks, the only history book you can rely on is the Bible. Okay? If, if you ever get into serious study of history, you're going to find out there's a lot of confusion there. Uh, this is a book by Gardner on the Egyptians. This is a reprint of something done in, in the mid-1900s. And what he did was uh, he obviously referenced a lot of the uh, archaeology and, uh, and history texts that were written before him. And, and, you know, you start reading through these history books and you notice this guy's, one guy that's quoted a lot is Flinders Petrie. He's, he was a big archaeologic uh, historian and Egyptologist back in the late 1800s, and he did a lot of the digs back then, and he's quoted a lot. When you start reading the books and you find they're all quoting the same person, it all kind of whittles down to just a few sources. And the thing I find is there's great confusion. Uh, here's a book that we studied before by Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones, and he wrote a book on uh, chronology, studying the scriptures. And he says, although much research continues... It must first be noted, even to this day, this book was written in the 1990s, I believe. 1993. He says, even to this day, uh, the period under discussion in Exodus around 1780 to 1400, uh, no, 1780 to 1546 B.C. is one of great obscurity in Egyptian history. 
I have uh, done a lot of investigation into this matter, examining the findings of L. Wood, J. Davis, M. Unger, uh, Petri, there he is, uh, uh, Breestead, Erdmans, uh, Rowley, Gardner, that's the book I have here, Hall, Harrison, Albright, Bunsen, J. F. Free, uh, Sir James Gardner Wilkinson, and Schultz, to name but a few. And notwithstanding, it's the purpose of this, it's not my attempt to study and solve all the problems of Egyptology and Egyptian chronology, but I'll tell you, he says, the period under investigation and discussion is one of great obscurity. They don't know. I mean, there are centuries, people just have dates from centuries, they, they don't know. Some guy says it happened in the 1700s with a certain uh, pharaoh, another one says, no, it happened in 1400 BC, and they're off by three to four centuries. Don't look so surprised, okay? <laughs> Don't, don't, be not uh, amazed, Christians. The only reliable book is the one you're holding in your hands, the Holy Scriptures of God, the King James Holy Bible. Every other book down here is faulty and has problems with it. I know this from my various my field of medicine. I mean, as I study medical textbooks, I notice a lot of uh, conflicting ideas on just one disease process written all at the same period. You want to go back four decades... You want to go back four centuries, and you find tremendous conflict. History. You know, God made the English language. I remember once uh, I was working at a hospital, and, and it was run by a bunch of liberals, and, and uh, you know, liberals seem to run everything down here in the world. They run the education system, they run the government, they run the press, they run Hollywood, they run everything. And of course, they, you know, they're not saved, and so they have goofy ideas. And, and they, they made us take this sensitivity training course, and it was run by a black woman, and she was up there, and she was mad and histrionic and screaming and angry at the word history because it's his story, his story. What about the women? Look, God made the language. It is his story. Amen. <laughs> history is his story. It's about him. He gets the preeminence. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My point being this, if you take someone that hasn't received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you let them do anything, study archaeology, study medicine, study kitchen science, study automobiles, they're going to make mistakes. By nature, sinners have a sin nature and they make mistakes. And then, if you allow them to write something as precious as history, you find it constantly being in the hands of people that have an agenda. That's right. Uh, have you read anything about the 1980s? I lived through the 1980s. <laughs> and I'm told what a time of great poverty that was. And, and how America had lost, America gained a lot in the 1980s. The, the point is, if you can't trust what you're reading about something that's two or three decades old, it's hard to know what you're reading about something that's uh, 30 or 40 centuries before, except this book right here. Amen. This book you can count on. Amen. Now, we're talking about the Pharaoh this new pharaoh. There's a lot of question in the Egyptology books as to who the pharaoh was. I've read all kinds of uh, speculation and, and postulating as to who this pharaoh was. This one book just recorded a number of the names of the pharaohs. Uh, there's Am Amosis, there's Amenhotep, there's Thutmose the first, Thutmose the second, Thutmose the third, there's Hatshepsut, there's Amenhotep the second, there's Thutmose the fourth, there's Amenhotep the third, there's Smenklari, there's Tutankhamun, we've heard that one, there's Horonheb, there's Ramesses the first, Ramesses the second, there's Merenptah, there's Seti the first, there's all different kinds of pharaohs. People aren't sure how or when or who was in charge, but God will give you a little insight as to who this pharaoh was. Now, let me show you. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 7, and then after that, we're going to be turning back to Isaiah 52. So on your way to Acts, you might want to stop at Isaiah 52. Acts 7 and Isaiah 52. There's a new king that's going to rise up. This king doesn't know Joseph. A king who knew not Joseph. Acts chapter 7. Stephen is preaching. He's recounting the history of the nation. And he says in Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 14, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. It looks like a problem text, doesn't it? Does anybody know how to add? Okay. Okay. Three score and fifteen. Do you know how much that is? That's 75. At 75, somebody says, hey, the Bible's got a mistake in it. Because we just read in Exodus chapter 1, how many people came down? 70. 70. This says 75. 
Let's clear that up real quickly. If you read very carefully in Exodus, it says, All the souls that came out of his loins of Jacob were 70 souls. These are all the ones that were direct blood related to Jacob. This one says all his kindred, not out of his loins. Uh, maybe a cousin that's not, that's not a blood relative out of his loins, but a cousin. See, So he brought some other relatives down that were kindreds, that were cousins of his. And when you count all those up, it's 75. But the ones out of his loins, including him, were 70. There's no problems or contradictions in the Bible if you read slowly and you read carefully. Isn't that good to know? Mm. Look, here, let me just tell you. Every place I go, when I sit in a meeting and some idea is being discussed, sooner or later, and you've probably observed this yourself, someone will pipe up, oh, let me play the devil's advocate. Have you ever heard anyone say that? <laughs> my, my observation is everybody wants to play the devil's advocate because that's all I ever hear. Well, well, let me play the Lord's advocate. Can I do that for a second? By the way, you ought to do that once in a while when you're in a meeting somewhere. Okay? You ought to do that. Are you God's people? Amen. You never want to be the devil's advocate. Right. Ever. Mm. Let the devil's children have his advocates. Let them be the advocates. Sometime at a meeting one day when something's going around and you think about the right way it ought to be handled, go, may I just be the Lord's advocate for a moment? I, I, think, I think the Bible would have us do it this way. I think the Lord would be pleased if we did it this way. All right. All right. Now look at it. Look at it. Every devil and his advocate wants to cast aspersions on this book. You want to be the Lord's advocate? When a supposed contradiction comes up like this, first off, just trust God. The contradiction and the darkness is in your mind. This is a, this is a light, but you and I are dark. And sometimes it takes a while for the light to get through to us. So just be the Lord's advocate and trust God. Say, I don't quite see it yet, now yet. But I know that God wrote it right. I'm just not seeing it. Okay? I have many things to say unto you, Jesus said, but you're not ready to bear them. When the time's right, he'll reveal it to you. Mm -hmm. But lots of the supposed contradictions are so simple when you just read them carefully like we read here. One were the souls out of his loins and the other are his kindred. Okay? One are direct progeny and the other is the progeny plus his cousins. Isn't that easy? You just trust God. Be the Lord's advocate. Don't doubt the book. Mm -hmm. Doubt the doubter of the book. Good advice. Amen. All right, so we're reading through here in the seventh chapter. Let's find out. Okay, so they're coming down into Egypt, uh, verse 15. So Jacob went down into Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. Verse 17, but when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Now, the Egyptian king, the Egyptian pharaoh, loved Joseph. This man that's now in charge is not an Egyptian. This man is a different king. Egypt was under bondage itself of another ruler. Turn to Isaiah chapter 52. In secular history, they talk about this as the times of the Hyksos kings. H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, I don't know the term, it's some Egyptian term that they've given to these kings. It's supposed to mean rulers, something rulers. But, but here, the, the, the Lord will help you, this other king. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and, here it is, the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Assyria had taken over Egypt for a while. And the king that was in charge at this time, this new king that arose, is an Assyrian. So ruling down here in Egypt, this new king is an Assyrian. Isaiah 52, verse 4. Now remember, I was showing you before that in my thinking, Egypt is more a type of the natural man, the earthy man. E, Egypt, E, earth. The fleshy man. Assyria is kind of a type of the devil and the Antichrist. You're in Isaiah. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, in your precious Holy King James Bible, 
We have revealed to us the name of the one that fell from heaven. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Only in the King James Bible does it reveal his name for us. Otherwise, we wouldn't know his name. They take it out of the New Bibles because he's preparing his world church and his world government, and he doesn't want his name known until he springs it on them at the end. And if they don't have it in the Bible, they won't know who he is. But we know. Because like Jesus said, you can't deceive the very elect. And the very elect have this book. And in this chapter, we learn all about the, the cherub, Lucifer, that fell from heaven. The one that took God on. And, in the, and, and as this chapter progresses, and you get down uh, to 25, he says this. You know, as I've purposed, so shall it stand, verse 25, that I will break the Assyrian in my land. Assyrian is connected with the devil. The Assyrian is connected with the devil here. Let me show you another place where he's connected with them. Go to Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel chapter 31. Verse 3. And again, the connection in verse 2. Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, Who art thou in thy likeness? Behold the Assyrian. There's that Assyrian king, the oppressing king. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. And then he talks about how he's this big tree. And in the Bible, you've probably noticed men are likened to trees. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I mean, that's how his root shall spread out and his leaf shall not wither. And, uh, and so men are likened to trees. And here the Assyrian is likened to a big tree, the cedar in Lebanon. Notice verse 8. Uh, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. Uh, verse 9. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Here's this Assyrian connected with the devil, the devil all the way back to the Garden of Eden, all the way back to the Garden of God. So, so as I go through the scriptures, just to help you in, in the way I see it, reading through over and over and over, I know it's been preached to me a million times, Egypt is a type of the world, but as I go through it carefully, what I see is Assyria is a type of spiritual oppression. Devil. Egypt is a type of flesh or earthy, and Babylon is a type of the world system. That's the big three. I don't know why I'm teaching this now, but since we're kind of looking at it, what the heck, you may as well know the way. And this is how I see it as I go through it. Babylon's type of the world system. And again, you and I aren't so much saved out of the world or saved out of the spirit of the devil. We're saved out of our flesh. In my flesh profiteth no good thing. By the works of the flesh shall no man be justified in his sight. Get rid of the devil, get rid of the world. I got problems with number one right here. Biggest problem in the universe is right here. I look in the mirror, that's my biggest problem. Who's your biggest problem? Get a mirror. <laughs> It'll help you. All right? <laughs> the devil didn't make you do it. And it's not the world. It's our sin nature. And that's what we're saved out of. And so this, this Antichrist, this, this Assyrian Egyptian ruler is a type of the Antichrist. He knew not Joseph. Joseph is a picture of Jesus. Later on you will see the Pharaoh say in chapter 5, Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. That's the same kind of attitude the Antichrist is going to have in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, it says in uh, chapter uh, 1 and verse 8, In flaming fire Jesus will take vengeance on them that know not God. Who's God? Jesus is God. Amen. <laughs> I know not the Lord. And he knew not Jesus. He knew not Joseph. That's this new Assyrian. Uh, the same one in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who exalteth, opposeth, and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. That's this Assyrian that's persecuting God's people. So the persecution of God's people, the new generation, they're being persecuted by the new king the Assyrian that's ruling in Egypt.
Oh, Joe says we're running out of time. So we're going to have to continue these verses in, in the New King and, and see some of his tactics that he uses with the new strategy next week. Any questions on what we've looked at so far? Well, let's pray and thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for the book of Exodus. Thank you for a way out. Thank you for being our mighty Redeemer. Thank you for saving me from me. <laughs> um, Lord, I do pray that as we study through this book and, and we see historically what you've done and doctrinally what you're going to do, that spiritually we can see the pictures as they apply to our lives. Help us, Lord. Thank you for showing us a way out. Help anyone else to find the way out through the mighty Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.